All right, let's see if this solves the problem then. Um, yeah, it seems like it's working. Uh, very, very welcome everyone to yet another live stream here on the Mentor Pilot channel. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, for those of you who are technically inclined, apparently for some reason the uh, live stream key had changed. So I was using the old key for my um, encoder uh, and I had to change the key. So now it's working and now here we are. Um, guys, how are you all doing? Um, like, I love doing these live streams because it gives me the one and only chance I have to talk directly to you guys. And I know that there's so many out there who have questions maybe about your aviation training, maybe about you being a little bit afraid of flying or general questions about the 737 or whatever it might be. So for the next 45 minutes, I am here for you guys. And uh, the way that this works is that I try to do as many questions as I can from the normal chat. I see that's going crazy at the moment, which is good. Uh, but if you have something that you really, really want to ask me, well, in that case, use the super chat function, okay? That's the little um, dollar sign just below the normal chat um, window. And when you do so, you will be donating some money to the channel to support what I do, the videos that I make, well, basically everything that I do. Um, so if you want that, that's going to highlight the questions you might have for me. And it means that I will be answering that question. Okay, so I will be taking Super Chat questions first, and then I will be taking questions from the normal chat. And that's how it works. So let's see who's here. We got Mike French. He's here. Hello from Japan. I hope you're doing good. Guys, I know it's scary times out there. Um, with the, uh, the coronavirus now engulfing the globe, it's now been called officially a pandemic, and it is raging absolute havoc in the aviation industry, as you might imagine. Um, we don't know exactly how bad this is going to get. The only thing I can say is that within my 18 years of flying, I've never seen anything like this. Um, I was actually, well, I started my career back just before 9-11, and after 9-11, it was very, very bad because people were afraid of flying. But uh, the, the fear was different then. The, the fear was kind of connected to terrorism. And they thought, well, it's a remote thing. I'm not flying to the United States. It's unlikely that I am going to be subjected to this. But this fear is different. This is a fear of people um, thinking that there might be diseases everywhere, but also of not wanting to get stuck away from their families, so be quarantined in a different country, for example. And I completely understand that fear. However, um, at this point, I think we are going to see the worst, the brunt of this now during the next couple of weeks. Uh, so I would say, you know, keep a close eye on on the healthcare professionals, the World Health Organization, um, and what people are saying in your community. Um, make sure that you you know, keep your hands clean. I know that I am saying that together with millions of other people, but what we do have to do at this point for the risk groups is try to, to kind of stop, not stop the virus because we're not going to be able to do that, but to shallow it out a little bit, make sure that it doesn't peak all of a sudden and so that the healthcare system breaks down because that's what I am afraid of. I'm, I'm not particularly worried about the um, virus myself since I'm not in a risk group yet, but I am worried about um, a, a huge wave of um, infections um, that might overwhelm the healthcare system so that the people, the old, the fragile, the ones that are likely to really get badly affected by this can't get the care that they need. So we all have to work together now, guys, to try to, um, to kind of slow this thing down so it becomes manageable for the, uh, for the healthcare systems. So, um, that's what, with all that due, I see William M has sent a uh, super chat question. However, there's no question connected to it. So William, you're going to have to try that again. Um, if you, if you end up sending a super chat question that doesn't come through, then what I suggest you do is you get the mentor aviation app, uh, and then you go to submit feedback, which is a function on the settings and that will send me an email. So just write super chat questions in the, uh, in the email header and I will answer it directly from you there. So I see there's a lot of people saying, Hey, from France and from, uh, let's see here, what tips would you have for a young aspiring pilot? Right. Uh, yeah, it depends a little bit where you are in your in your training or your aspirations. Um, obviously, the first thing you're going to have to do is figure out what your budget is, um, what kind of time scale you have for your training. Uh, once you've done that, then you can start to navigate whether or not you want to go through a modular or an integrated course. 
Um, generally speaking, in a, in a good economy, then it doesn't really matter what you choose. It's likely that you're going to get a chance at a job um, or a job interview anyway. Uh, but when it comes to a down, like a, a slightly worse economy, like what we're about to enter into now, from the way it looks, uh, then the school that you go to might be more important. The connections that that school might have is going to be more important. And that's why we are working on the Airline Pilot Club, so that we can give you both indications about how suitable you are before you start en- paying any kind of money, that's extremely important, but also what schools that you should go to, schools that we have checked out, that our experienced team has gone to and verified that they have a good curriculum, that they have good instructors, good material to fly with as air craft and that they have a good economy so that they don't go bankrupt and take your money with it so consider joining up with the airline pilot club as soon as you're opening up i'm guessing there's going to be more questions about the airline pilot club i'll take them as they come david wilson will the 737 max order cancellations actually help boeing by eliminating payments to airlines for delivery delays no, I like I. First of all, when it comes to talking about what is good and what's not good for Boeing, I'm not really the right person to say so. But I I can say with almost 100% certainty that they're not happy about order cancellations. Order cancellations is only bad for them. All right, they would have gotten a little bit of money in down payment, but I mean, what keeps the factory going is the the orders they have online, and and you know losing orders is not good for their image it's not good for anything so no even though they might save a little bit of money short term uh long term that's not going to be uh, a, a good thing uh, I, I should say at this point as well guys that um i have taken the decision i don't know if you've noticed that on the channel but uh, i am not talking about the 737 max issue anymore uh, nor am i talking about the 737 um like Basically, I, I went down a path before Christmas where I went in really deep into the Max issue and in Boeing and, and everything. And I started doing some videos about that. And what I realized now lately is that, you know, I am going to fly this aircraft. Um, I am going to be part of, you know, when this the 77 Max comes online, I'm going to have to fly it. I'm a manager that I'm going to have to talk to to my cadets and instruct them on the type and stuff. And it's not really a good idea for me to sit and do those kind of videos um, at this point. OK, if I wasn't flying, if I wasn't a part of the, the you know, the operative side, then I could be sitting here and I could be guessing wildly or telling you the things that I do know or the things that I've found out. But as I am an operational pilot that will actually fly this aircraft, it's not a great idea for me to be to be kind of interacting on that side. So I hope that you understand that and that you that you um, respect my decision to kind of tune it down a little bit when it comes to the to the uh, um, investigative uh, journalism from a non-journalist like myself. I'm going to be talking about things that I actually know, you know, the things that I know as, a, as an experienced line training captain, type rating instructor and type rating examiner. That's what I built this channel on and that's what I'm going to continue to do. Uh, right, so Joseph Charles is the next one in the super chat. Greetings from the States. No question, just a thank you for the fantastic channel. Well, that's always great to hear. And and also, on that note, I would love to get more feedback about what you guys want me to do more videos about. Like, I do try to, to talk about current events now. Like, I did the ghost plane videos yesterday because I, I got really upset when I saw that these ghost planes were still flying. Um, I hope that you had a chance to watch that. I'm going to do more videos like that if something happens in the industry. Um, but I'm also going to concentrate more on technical videos, um, do more technical descriptions, uh, more instructive and more things for people who are afraid of flying because that's something that I really care deeply about. So, But your, your suggestions are really, really valuable, guys. I, uh, write in in the comment field on my videos. Um, contact me directly through the Metro Aviation app or through Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Every time you see something, you think that, you know, that dude mentor, he should be explaining this. Well, then let me know, because it might be something I can do a quick video about. And thank you very much, uh, Joseph, for your kind uh, support of the channel. Nice and Lee. Hello from Washington, DC. As a frequent business traveler, all my trips are canceled or postponed at this point. I really want to help, but I can't think of a way to help airlines to survive this crisis. Uh, no, and it's not really your your job to do that either. Um, 
in a situation like this, the state actually have to step in. Like, um, what is likely to happen is that the airlines that have good economy, that have a lot of money and that own most of their fleets, um, they will probably be able to weather through this quite well by cancelling um, you know, flights, putting the aircraft down on the ground, putting their uh, employees on unpaid leave temporarily uh, and just kind of hunker down and weather this through. Airlines that 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 is surviving because of their day-to-day -day operation, as in they might have huge loans on their... Um, their aircraft, for example, uh, they, they are going to be very hard hit by this. And it's a possibility that we might see some bankruptcies because of this. Now, um, there might be a case where the state, as in, you know, whatever their base is going to come in and say, like, okay, what we're going to do is we are going to let you not pay any company taxes during this period. Or we will tell the banks to keep your loans on hold or things like that. Because this is extraordinary times and it calls for extraordinary measures. And that's likely what we are going to start to see in, in, in not only the airline industry, in many, many industries. Because, you know, like this is a time where we as a race, as the human race, have to come together and help each other out. Because, I mean, this is a flu, um, a, a very, very, very bad type of flu. But, I mean, the next pandemic could be something far, far worse. Um, and we need to learn that these things, as the population of the globe keeps growing, we get more and more people and we're more and more interconnected, we are going to have to come up with some kind of formula for how to deal with this. And that means the economic system as well. That the state, there has to be a, a like kind of a red button that the states can push, which stops the transactions, which just kind of puts everything on hold until we have sorted something like this out, and then we can re restart the system again. How that's going to be done, well, that's up to some much, much smarter people than me to figure out. But this, this is what we need to do. Um, World Wide West. Great to have you here. World Wide West is also very active in the uh, Mentor Aviation app, so it's great to see him here as well. He's one of the premium users in the app, which means that when I do my, my live streams that I do in the app, which I do much more frequently than I do it here on YouTube, uh, he is also able to ask questions on that. So that's one of the perks of being a premium user in the app. Were you nervous the first time you flew passengers? Um, yeah. But not because there was passengers on board, um, more because the first time I flew passengers was basically my first day on line training, uh, which meant that I was just nervous because I needed to remember all of my training, all of the SOPs, impress the, the scary line training captain, all of these things. Um, so I, I don't think I even remember that I had passengers on board. At that point, you're just so focused on doing a good job that you've been trained for you, that, that you don't really think of it. But I do remember the sound of passengers boarding and kind of thinking that, oh, cool, actually, I am going to have close to 200 people behind me now that's expecting me to be just as professional as any other pilot. And it, it was motivating. Uh, and yeah, sure. It was. I was. Uh, I was nervous. There's no question. You will. All, you will be nervous when you do a new job, especially if you're coming in as a fresh airline pilot. So uh, more questions here. I'm getting a little bit behind. Uh, I have to remember to not answer the questions for such a long time. <laughs> Um, so Alexander Bondebal, hi. I'm go. I'm going to fly for the first time in June. I'm on vacation uh, from NL to United States. Um, hope it goes well. Thanks for the videos. Yeah, yeah, no, it's going to be great. Um, providing that this coronavirus doesn't stop all air traffic for a period of time. But uh, during in like June, July, the it, it should have gotten better. No matter how bad this gets, as we get into the summer month, um, it should get at least temporarily better. So um, yeah, I, I wish you the best. And if you have any questions, anything I can help you with. Um, then come in, just tag at mentor in the app and, and I can try to answer your questions or ask any of the other professional pilots that are in there every day to, to help out. Um, thank you very much for supporting the channel. Uh, Brian Blazer is just uh, and is just sending in some sending in uh, money to support. Thank you very much. And if you did have a question, then like I said, go to the Mentor Aviation app and send me an email there so that I can answer it for you. Thank you very much. It's very generous. Uh, Steol77, 
uh, in what occasions do you change the bank degree on the heading selector on the uh, autopilot? Default is 20 degrees, right? Why change it from that default? Uh, the default is 25 degrees. That gives you a, a rate one turn in the 737. Um, I would change that on a few occasions. Basically, um, if let's say that you're doing a circling maneuver, which is where you do an instrument approach to one runway, and then you have a lot of tailwind there, uh, so that you do a visual circuit around and you land on the other runway. This is something we do very rarely, but we practice. Sometimes if you end up a little bit too close to the runway when you're doing the parallel flying, then as you're turning, you will see on the trend vectors on your navigation display that you're going to overshoot the turn. And in that case, it's a good idea to increase the bank angle to make sure that you get nicely onto the final approach track and you don't overshoot. Uh, that can be done as well if you get very tight radar vectors. So like the air traffic control makes this mistake um, and you see that the vector that they give you the inbound vector for the ILS too late, for example, well, then you can just increase the bank angle to get him to, you can put it max to 30 degrees. 30 degrees is still safe and um, it will do quite a bit of difference um, to, uh, to your turning radius. So that's when you would use it. You will very rarely put it to lower value than that. Uh, Samud Ahmad. Thank you very much. And uh, Moiji is always appreciated. Uh, Dom44. Hi, Mentor. I love your videos. Well, thank you. I want to ask, when do pilots use rudder trim? Have you considered a video about pressurization or radio systems? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, pressurization, I have already done a, a few videos on, actually. I've done videos about... Uh, a rapid depressurization as an emergency descent. I've done briefing videos about that as well, where I've discussed why we have a pressurization system, how it works and so on. So those videos already exist. And radio systems is uh, possibly coming up. I'm just gonna <laughs> give you a tip about that. Um, um, I'm, I'm, we'll see if I go into the technical part of the radio systems or if you just go into the communication part of it, but it is definitely on there. Just have to go back here to make sure I haven't skipped any of the uh, super chat questions here. No, seems like I'm good. Um, rudder trim. Let's see, that was another part of that question. So, the reason that you do use rudder trim um, is, for example, if you have an engine failure. So let's say that you take off and you get an engine failure. You're going to have to put rudder in in order to keep the aircraft on track in that case. And it means that as long as you have you know, thrust on one engine but not on the other, you're going to have asymmetrical thrust. So the aircraft will constantly want to turn to one side, which means you have to put opposite rudder to that to make sure that the aircraft stays straight. Okay? But of course, you don't want to sit for ages with a lot of pressure on one side but not the other because soon, unless you are the Hulk, you are going to start feeling it in your leg, right? Your muscles is going to start getting fatigued. So what we do then is that you keep the pressure in until you reach cruise, like if you climb up to 3,000 feet after takeoff and then you start turning back in for a possible approach back home again. Well then, when the thrust is set for cruise, then you take and you trim out the difference. With an engine failure on the 737, we're talking about maybe four units, four, four and a half units of rudder trim in order to sit with cruise thrust set um, and, air, and fly without much pressure, right? But you of course have to remember that you have that trim in um, when you come on to approach later, but you keep that in. And then if you have to do a go around, well then you're gonna have to enter a little bit more rudder in, but it's not gonna be as much as it was during the takeoff. Uh, but that's the one of the reasons you use rudder trim. Other times is if the aircraft is not completely trimmed out when you're in level flight with two engines. And in that case, you can trim the aircraft out. You'll see that by the yoke being slightly displaced. So instead of being kind of central, that it should always be, you'll see that the yoke is sitting a little bit like this. In that case, the aircraft is not properly trimmed. And what you do is you put heading select, you wait for a while, let the aircraft stabilize itself on the heading. Look at the heading bog. Now, the heading indicator should be in the middle of the heading bog. If it's not, you're not in trim. So then you just take and you toggle the trim a little bit towards the downside of the aileron. So you put it towards the downside and you'll see how the aileron has started to, to kind of rectify itself, put a little bit more until it's perfectly straight. And then you look at the heading selector and the heading indicator again. If they are now matching, then you go back into LNAV and the aircraft is trimmed and that's it. Cool, Glenn Watson. Uh, thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, what's the difference between an integrated school and others? At the moment, I'm just paying for 
per hour training since I only want to go to PPL. Yeah, so what you're doing is a modular course. A modular course is where you go and you, you get the training part separately. So say that you, you only want to do a PPL. Right, great. So you get a PPL. But then after a few years and you've been flying and you find out that actually I like this. This is nice. You know, I want to I want to do this professionally. Well, then you already have a PPL. So then you would, since you have gained some hours, you can go for your commercial pilot license and your instrument rating and your multi-engine rating. And you're kind of buying these things in blocks, hence modular. All right. The, the benefit of that is that you can keep the cost quite low if you play it smart. Uh, you can spread it out over time so that you can work at the same time as your training. Um, and then basically, you know, you have the same, same licenses when you get out of it as an integrated training. Now, the downside is that uh, it's harder to track. Okay, so from, from an airline's point of view, if they want to come in and they want to track your training history and you've gone to three, four different schools and done this, it's going to be harder for them to track and see what kind of training um, quality that you've had. That's one thing. The second thing is that you're not connected to a flight school which has powerful connections to the airlines. So while you, if you do an integrated training, which is a kind of like a like a made program for you, you start, it takes about 18 to 24 months and they take you from zero to hero in those 18 to 24 months. Well then those are normally much more expensive. They're done in a much shorter time frame. And the schools who do this, they also work hard to try to, to get um, uh, their students straight from the training into an airline. So you might on a on a, in a bad business in a bad sorry in a in a bad economy like the one that we're seemingly facing now, you might benefit from that. Okay, so those are the main differences. Uh, uh, um. Prank Monkey six fifty. Thank you for your support. Papas, why is plane tilted slightly up during flight? Can a helicopter pilot fly a plane and vice versa? Um, well, it is slightly tilted up uh, because it needs a little bit of an angle of attack in order to continue to um, to fly, right? So it will have a slight pitch up. Um, on the 737, it's about two and a half degrees, something like that. And then as the speed decreases, you'll get more and more pitch up and the speed increases, you'll need less and less. But you do need a little bit of an angle of attack towards the air in order for the aircraft to keep flying. So that's that tends to be why. Uh, a helicopter pilot can cannot automatically fly a plane uh, just as a plane pilot cannot automatically fly a helicopter but we do get a lot of benefits from having flown the other type so if you take let's say that I for example if I want to go and do a helicopter um, course I'm gonna have to start from the beginning because I can't hover it I can't you know deal with the controls however I understand everything else all of the the, the instrumentation the systems and when it's flying straight ahead well then it works kind of like an airplane so I probably would have some help from it and I can reduce the amount of training down to minimum, a legal minimum, things like that. So there are some benefits of having flown another thing before. However, um, the answer is no. Like if you put me in a helicopter, I will be wobbling around just like a beginner in, you know, that's flying a helicopter or an aircraft for the first time. Cool. Um, Let's see. So, Samu Damad, thank you very much for uh, your support. Uh, Grant Rennie, hello from Scotland. Have a great night. Well, you too. Um, I am actually, I don't know if you noticed that, but I've, I'm doing more videos. I'm trying to do a little bit more videos. I did three videos last week. I've done one yesterday and it's going to come one on Friday as well. And the reason is because I'm furloughed at the moment. I'm on unpaid leave. I don't, I'm not at the moment employed as a pilot. Uh, <laughs> I am. I'm going to get back again after my two months of unpaid leave, but I'm not actually working now. So I'm pe I'm putting much more emphasis on the channel because that's basically all I have. You guys, the social media channels that I do, um, that's what I'm working with for these two months. And I have some, of course, the airline pilot club is also a lot of work, um, but we haven't we haven't officially launched it yet. So um, yeah. So if you're if you're wondering why he's suddenly doing live streams on Wednesdays and uh, sending out three videos and stuff. That's why. All right. So March and April, that's uh, this. I'm here for you guys. And also, um, I've been getting a little bit of slack. I wanted to mention that. I've been getting a little bit of slack for having so much um, sponsored videos. My Friday videos basically are all sponsored and that's what I'm aiming for. Because, you know, right now I am actually kind of 
surviving on this. Like my family depends on the channel taking in the money that's needed to, to run the household for these two months. And we don't know now with the coronavirus happening as well, if all of the flights in Spain gets grounded, for example, like it happened in Italy already, then, you know, I don't know how long we are going to be sitting on the ground. So I ask you to please have a little bit of understanding when it comes to, uh, to my sponsored content. Um, and, you know, please, if you like it, do come with with feedback if you think it's becoming too much or or if you think I should be doing it in a different way or if there's a way that I could do it more effectively but it is it is literally my job at the moment so that's why that's happening so I just wanted to tell everyone that I hope you understand so um, DJ BDP Big Daddy Parker thank you hi mentor quick question I am six foot Five. Am I too tall to be a commercial pilot? Is there restrictions? Now, I am more into the metric system, so I don't know, six foot five, we'll have to really, let's see if we can, can quickly check how much that is. So inches to, what's that? Six foot five inches, is it? So feet to centimeters. Let's see if this thing does it. So six six feet is, I think you're around two meters, aren't you? But I have to check it. Six feet is 182 or 183 centimeters. Inches to... So five. So 12, 183, 195. No, that's fine. That's fine. I've flown with, with cadets that are over two meters tall. Um, you, If you are like in smaller aircraft and in really small trainers, you might be a little bit cramped. So I advise you when you're looking for a flight school to go and check with the flight school, you know, how they're, um, what kind of aircraft they're using and do what we call a functional test flight, which is just go out, sit in the cabin, see, make sure that you can reach all the controls and stuff without banging stuff because if you're sitting in a Cessna 152 or something it's going to be quite small but um, but yeah I have been instructing um, cadets that's flown the 737 that's been over two meters and I think a bit over two meters tall uh, without without any issues at all so that shouldn't be a problem uh, Natalie Olson I made this live stream Great, Natalie! Finally, Natalie is uh, also one of my patrons and in, uh, very active inside of the app as well. And she's always complaining that that I do that I do these live streams too early because um, obviously I'm guessing you're in the United States, which means that it's it's not you know it's when people are traveling from work and stuff, depending on where you are in the state. So I'm really happy to see you here, Natalie. I made this live stream, thank you. From the ghost flight video, does the 80-20 slot rule also affect international flights coming in from the States, for example? And yes, it does. If, because um, those, those airlines will need slots in, for example, Heathrow, all right? So let's say American Airlines are coming in to Heathrow, they would have bought slots to actually fly in and out of Heathrow. And in order for them to, to keep those slots, yes, they would need to do that. Uh, at least that's the way I've gotten it explained. Um, then, of course, it's going to be a matter of whether or not they care about it or if they think that this is going to be equal for everyone. But anyway, the uh, the um, European Union is is legislating now to get rid of the 80-20 rule for now. So I don't think it's going to be an issue anymore. I really hope so, because if there's something that makes me really, really pissed off, it is um, to watch waste. It's to see poor airlines, well, poor airlines, and see airlines that are potentially um, struggling, having to go out and fly their like huge beasts of aircraft empty just to satisfy some stupid rule somewhere. That makes me really angry. And it's not like we're having, we're not putting enough shit out into the atmosphere as it is. So um, I really hope that I will qu quickly stop. Glenn Watson, thank you very much. I don't know why your um, your message was taken back, but we'll see what happens with that. The ILS pilot, hey from Sverige, best of school in Sverige. Um, right, so the best, um, I haven't checked them all, right? But since I haven't checked them all, the only one that I can actually uh, say anything about is the school that I went to myself, which is OSM Flight Academy, all right? They were called 
Bromma flygskola back in the day. Then they became SAA and now they're OSM Flight Academy. And the reason I can talk about them is because I went there myself and I know some of the people that are working there, which are really great guys. And I know that they are all about quality. So OSM, I have no problems talking about. When it comes to recommending other flight schools, guys, I'm going to be very careful. And basically from the day that the um, Airline Pilot Club launches, I will only be be talking about and I will only be recommending flight schools that are part of the Airline Pilot Club and the very reason for that is because we started it. Me and Andy O'Shea started the Airline Pilot Club in order to satisfy quality, right? We want perfect, not perfection, but quality in every step of the way. Quality in the students coming in and the flight schools that are doing the training, the training that the flight schools are doing and in the airlines that are taking over. And the only way to do that is to have an unbiased system where we can send in people and actually check the flight school because I don't want to be here sitting here telling you like, yeah, this flight school, you could check that out. And it turns out that it's, you know, that they are going bankrupt within three months or something like that. The only way that I can be sure that not going to happen is to have a review of the flight school, which is what we will do as part of the work of the airline pilot club. So, Siamud, uh, sorry, Samud Ahmad, thanks for keeping us informed about the airline industry and with your time. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here, for supporting the channel, uh, for viewing my videos. Um, if, if you want, if you really want to help me, guys, like I'm, I'm trying to build a channel, I'm trying to, to widen it. And the only way I can do that is with the help of you guys. If you, you know, if you share my videos when they come out, if you see something you like, then please put it out on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. Like it really, really helps to spread the word. And the more people I can get in here and watching my videos and, and helping out with suggestions and new content and stuff, the better stuff I'm going to be making. Um, so thank you for being here, is what I wanted to say. Ian Jill, hey Ian, long time no seen. Great to have you here. I might have missed it because I was late. How was your workload changed with the current situation? Yeah, and well, like I was saying a few minutes ago, my workload is very low at the moment. I'm on furlough um, for two months at least, and we'll see how long that is actually going to take. It might be longer than that. Um, so um, I am only working with the YouTube channel at the moment. Um, I'm traveling a lot as well. I was in the Pilot Expo um, just a few weeks back. And unless they close it down, which we, you know, you never know, but I'm going to the Pilot Careers live in Düsseldorf on the 21st. Uh, I'm going to have a keynote speech there and um, I'll probably have a meetup as well, even though the meetups is probably going to be more like a Q&A session uh, because I don't think that there should be, you know, people shaking hands, hundreds of people shaking hands <laughs> right now. So, uh, so I'm doing a lot of that as well. I'm traveling a lot to try to meet up with you guys because I, you know, it gives me energy. It gives me so much energy to meet up with you guys and hear your stories about your flight training, what you're doing, and things like that. It is so cool to be able to do that. Uh, Grant Rennie, thank you very much for the uh, hot dog. I'm getting hungry now. Uh, Air Mike 88, greetings from Seattle and hope you come back and pick up the brand new 77 Max. Hot coffee waiting for you. Oh. Hot coffee from Seattle. I'm listening to a really good podcast called Business War at the moment. Business Wars. Uh, and right now they're talking about the uh, the coffee war between Dunkin' Donuts and um, uh, Starbucks. And of course Starbucks is from Seattle. I love the cafe coffee that you guys do. You really take coffee seriously. And uh, yeah, well, so do I. So I would love a cup of hot coffee. And actually... If there's one thing that I would really like to do is to travel over to the States and do like a tour and, and go and have meetups in different cities after this outbreak is done, obviously, and meet up with you guys, you know, go out for coffee with you guys it would be so cool, so nice. Uh, so yeah, so if I do come and, sev and pick up a, a brand new 77 Max, I will let you guys know. Edwin Smith, thank you. I'm 49. Is that still norm uh, normal age to start with a PPL? I flew gliders when I was younger. I also flew a lot of flight sims. Uh, will that be a benefit? Yeah, the gliders definitely will. Uh, flight sim is depending a little bit on how you flew it. And 49, you can absolutely, I mean, you can take a PPL all the way up to 60, 65. Not an issue at all. The issue becomes a little bit if you want to go into this professionally because 
still, like like I've said previously on the channel, I have had um, I've met first officers that started in their fifties and and still went through with it. However, the the you know the the chance of actually um, taking back the money that you've invested into the training becomes smaller than. But you can definitely go for your PPL when you're forty nine. No questions at all. Um, Grant Rennie, thank you for the. That looks like a, I'm going to say that it is a piece of pie. <laughs> thank you. Oh, okay, guys, by the way, have any of you tried out the new clapping feature? Is that even available? I haven't seen anything about it. I've heard that YouTube have implemented it. As in, you can go and you can do, you can like pay for clapping if you like a video, for example, which is basically like a super chat where you, you're liking a video and you're basically just giving some money to a creator. Is there anyone who's seen that? Say yes if you have. Let's see if I can see um, if there's anything coming up in the normal chat here. Has anyone seen the clapping feature? You just have to say yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So we have one yes there. We have another yes. Do you guys like it? Is there something that... that because I'm I'm thinking that it should be something that I can see. Like, I would love to see if someone is, is giving a clap. I would love to see that kind of coming up on my control screen or something. Um, but at the moment, I think it's only the people who actually buys the clap who can see it. So, okay. So we're seeing a lot of yes and no. Do you look tired? Yeah, I'm a little bit, little bit tired, <laughs> but not not that bad, not at all. Okay, so Texas is checking in. Haven't seen it. Uh, right. So I see that. I think that it's only available in some countries, maybe in the US or so. Okay, I'll take some questions from the normal chat here as well. Mrs. Funshine, as someone who has a fear of flying, I want to thank you for your videos. They explain so much and it really do help to settle the nerves. Well, thank you. And and actually, I am working on a project right now where I'm going to create a course for nervous flyers. Like I'm gonna go in and really, really do my best to find professionals that can help um, do a, a full course. And it's going to sit here on mentopilot.com, all right? So um, I'm, I'm gonna create this course. I'm aiming for it to be a few hours long at least. I'm gonna make it as affordable as absolutely possible. And I, I really want the feedback from you guys if there's something that you want me to focus more on or less on. So if you get the Metro Aviation app once again and you use the submit feedback function, if you are a nervous flyer out there and there's something that you want me to do more of or less of, or if you just want to be part of a testing group, then let me know, please, because um, this, this nervous flyer thing is something that I really want to help work on. Um, have you ever flown into Tallinn? Yes, I have. I've flown many times into Tallinn. I love flying into Tallinn. It's one of my favorite destinations, actually. It's so well organized. It just works. It's like you, you come up, you come in the flight level 400, you get a clearance down to flight level 130, down to 3000 feet, then in on the ILS, land, taxi off, everyone is waiting for you, everything works, you turn around, you go back out again. It's like it's a great airport to fly into. Uh, 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 right, more questions in the normal chat here. I am scared of flying. What shall I do? Yeah, that's that's what I wanted to like. I I have a vision of how I'm going to make this course. Right, I think I, I think I could be able to break through to you guys and explain some stuff. In a lot of ways, it's about you regaining control or feeling that you're regaining control by understanding what's going on around you and what you can expect. Ex you know, what is that sound? Why does it sound like that? Why is it coming at this phase of light? Things like that. So it's going to be a lot of that, but it's going to be a lot of exercises as well that you can use in order to relax yourself. Uh, Derek McGovern. Hi, Mentor. I'm from Ireland. Uh, in my second year in high school, but I want to start my training as soon as I leave school. What do you think my chances are getting into a cadet program? Um, yeah, I mean, they should be fair. That's and that's another thing that the Airline Pilot Club is doing, all right? We are going to do something called an indicative assessment, which means you are going to, as a member of the club, and this is going to be exclusive for members of the club, you'll be able to get an assessment of yourself done, a professional ex assessment, okay? And you're going to get feedback, which means that either you'll get green light saying, yeah, Perfect, you can just go for it. You have a high likelihood of, of getting into a, um, a cadet program, for example, at a major flight school and then a, a job after that. Or it's gonna be, you're almost ready. And in that case, you're going to get loads of feedback as in you need to work on this part of your personality or numeracy or your English language skills or something like that. So it's going to help you. But crucially, it will also have a not ready, which is, which is going to be like, 
it's going to be the worst day of your life probably up until now when you get that but it is an indication that your personality is just not suitable at not at least not at the moment for becoming a pilot and the reason we have that is because i have seen personally and it is the saddest thing you can ever imagine if someone has gone through the training they've paid all that money to become a pilot and they've gone through and they come up for an airline assessment and they just cannot get through it like it maybe you're not even going to get to an assessment because the pre-assessment is too hard or uh, or they fail along the way all right that's something i want to put a stop to there are personality types out there unfortunately that that just is not suited if you are a person that for example for whatever reason freezes up completely on the stress on the pressure um that's something that you you don't you don't want to do when you get into this occupation. So basically, we're going to be helping out with that, making sure that that assessment comes before and not after the training is done. So the airline pilot club is we are creating it for you guys to make sure that there's a tool in there that can help you guys from the beginning all the way through. That's our intention anyway. Good. I'll go back down to super chat questions because I am falling a little bit behind here. Um, so, uh, Marvan, Jacobi, thank you very much. How does having an anxiety fit in the past affect the likelihood of getting an EASA class one? And are you familiar with pilots with history of having done sessions with psychologists? Thanks. Now, I like I haven't talked to, well, probably am, but most people, they don't talk about if they've had previous psychological problems. The, the one thing I know, and I, I did, this is actually in one of my videos that I did together with an AME. If you check for that, like medical mentor, just chat, it's looked at. I did two different videos with an AME, and we talked about psychological problems as part of that. And basically what he's saying is that, yes, you can have, had psychological problems in the past, uh, but you're not allowed to be on medication, okay? And you have to have been off medication and without any symptoms for I think six months as minimum. Um, and it's also likely that you're going to have maybe a little bit an extra evaluation as part of your of your medical cat one, um, class one. But it is possible. Like someone can have a had like this very. It's very common to have, especially for girls, to have had a bit of uh, psychological issues during the teenage years when the hormones are changing, um, and that can come with things like anxiety. It can come with uh, panic attacks and things like that. And it, that doesn't ma mean that you, when you're in your twenties, when you're fully developed and everything is done, that you will have any kind of problems whatsoever. So, psychotic uh, like psychiatric problems, and that, by the way, that can happen to me as well. Like say for example, I that we have some kind of bereavement in the family, or that all of a sudden I am you know losing a lot of money and lost my job and I'm going into depression because of it. That can happen, and I have to be able to go to a psychologist, uh, stop flying for a while, get myself better, and then get back on the line again once everything has been sorted out. It's crucially important that we have the ability to do that. Because if not, the only thing that would happen is it will drive the things on the ground. As in people will have psychological issues because people are people, you know, and they will have psychological issues anyway. And they will just not show it for fear of losing their job, for example. And then obviously you'll have someone flying that shouldn't be flying. So it's very, very important that, um, that it doesn't, that psychological issues does not come with a stigma of you know, losing your job or never being able to fly again. So that's a great question, and I, I'm really happy that you brought that up. Uh, 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 so, Roy, Ray changed. What did you change to Ray? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Ray changed. Let's see, I'm missing it. It's jumping here all the time. There we go. Thank you. I'm a nervous flyer and you help 100%. Well, thank you. Great. Once again, you are another one that I want to get into the app. Submit feedback. Send me an email so that I can build up a, a, like a group of people that can be evaluating my course when I've done it to see if it's as helpful as I hope it will be. Cookie Monster. What commercial aircraft would you want to fly if you couldn't fly the 737 and why? Um, I wouldn't mind try, trying on an Airbus. And actually, if I had a chance to get my hands on an Airbus 350, I would probably love to do that. Like, it looks like a beautiful aircraft. And I would love to try the Airbus philosophy as well. And if I did, it would be on an Airbus 350, I think. Otherwise, a Boeing 787 would be nice to try. Um, but apart from that, it, that doesn't... I mean, I would love to fly the 747 before it disappears as well. So, you know, every aviation geek would probably line those things up. Uh, every type of video, 
You're doing an absolutely fantastic job. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for all the hard work that you do here, moderating the chats, working out in the in the Mentor Aviation app. Like, I highly appreciate the work that you do, Adrian. It's, it's great. Thank you. Uh, David Wilson. She keeps asking, so helping her get it answered. Better so good. What is the computer system in airplane? Can you explain a little bit? Right. Okay. Um, thank you, David by the way, for helping out fellow aviators. Um, so there are different aircraft systems, but basically there are um, there is uh, computer modules in the in modern aircraft that takes in all of the information from, for example, external sensors like uh, alpha vanes that sh checks the uh, angle of attack, um, the pitot tube, the static tubes, um, all of that brings it into a data module, turns it in from analog data to to um, uh, digital data, and then it will present that into a flight management computer, which is the you know, you'll know it as an FMC, uh, which will then help determine, for example, how to work the engines. The engines are driven by the computers, um, so that all of this the systems is being used is being taken into a computer. It's kind of being mixed around, and then some of that information is going to go to show us the pilots what's going on on our instrumentation. It's going to go to show what's going on in the engines for our engine instrumentation, and it's also going to go to the engines themselves to um, to determine, for example, how much fuel is going to be pushed in. So basically, all of this is driven more or less through a computer. Now, then on top of that, you have the navigational systems that will go in into a different line. Um, it's very complicated to explain in detail what these computers do, but you can, it's like a modern car, you know? It's, it's the way that the modern car kind of feeds everything into a computer box. In our case, we have two, and then that information that we need to know is being fed from there, the, what engine needs to know is being fed from there, and it can all be kind of quickly fixed from there as well. So uh, I don't know, I mean, without without really kind of reading up and, um, uh, and having a, a module on how to explain this, it becomes very, very hard, <laughs> but I hope that makes some sense to you. Um, how do you see future of electric flying for short haul commercial flight? Do you see any chances for this from Weigel uh, 1? Um, yeah, I do. There, there's no question that we are going to see electric flights to a certain point. I don't think that we'll be able to see completely electric flight. I think we're going to see some kind of hybrid, first of all. Um, but if there is a breakthrough in battery technology, and the battery technology is actually getting you know 100% better every year, and that's actually true. Like they're they're increasing the the, um, uh, the power density, the energy density on the batteries with almost 100% per year. Uh, Siemens is huge on building this, for example. Of course, Tesla is working hard on it as well. Um, if they can get the energy density high enough into the batteries, then we might be able to see completely, um, completely electrically different flights. However, at the moment, it looks like that's far away in the future. So what I think we're going to see is electrical driven. Um, like the aircraft on the ground will be electric driven. It will be electrical motors that will help during the critical phases, like takeoff and landing, for example, to reduce um, overall fuel burn. And then in the cruise, it will probably be a, a normal engine that's driving at least from the show. But it could help to reduce the emissions with like 40, 50%. Like it, there is potential for some huge improvements here. So yeah, I do think that we will see, we'll probably see some demonstrators that are completely electrical, but they can only do a little bit of hop between two cities or something like that. But for it to be truly effective, we need to have a much higher uh, energy density than what we have at the moment. So, uh, Likudio, does Pavlos dog condition apply to pilots when doing checklists? Like saying check to an item and overseeing it, because uh, you did that countless times. It does, yes. Uh, we call it rhyming. So if you rhyme a checklist, that's when you just read back what you know the answer should be without checking it. And it, this is one of the most important points we do during um, simulator training, simulator checking, and also line training, is to watch the, the students when you call a checklist item, to actually look at them. Because the idea is that you they should hear the checklist item. So landing, le landing a lever, down. They should look at the item, verify it, and call. If they just call it, means they're not checking it and rhyming the checklist, and that's a recipe for disaster, 
right? Just look at the horrible, 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 the horrible crash that happened in Madrid. Um, you know, Spanair air flight that that took off without the flap set. That was an example of a rhyming checklist, um, as in. They were really, really stressed on the time, stressed over taxiing out. At some point, the flaps should have been set. It wasn't. It was called on the checklist. It was responded to as it was set, but it was never set. So it, 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 it is a matter of life and death in some cases to make sure that these checklist items are properly verified and properly called back. Whenever you find that you're rushing because you need to make a slot time or holdover time or whatever, then you just need to stop it, slow down, maybe even go back in the checklist and redo it because... It's just, you know, a checklist is there with only the most essential items. These items need to be exactly the way that they're written. If they're not, there's something wrong, okay? And it could be potentially dangerous. So, uh, Steol77, is it allowed to use Swedish snooze in the cockpit? Depends on the airline, but yeah. Um, snooze is not like smoking. It's only really uh, affecting you unless you start storing it in disgusting places. But uh, snooze can be used, yes. In most cases. Meg Parker Jasper. I'm a newbie, 12 months. I've geek after getting over my severe flight anxiety. The information you give and explain everything has helped to no end. Thank you so much. Meg, you you can't you can't understand how happy I ha am to hear that. Um, like one of the real reasons that I'm running this channel is for people like you. Um, so that you can feel a bit more secure and can enjoy holidays with your friends and go, you know, extend the freedom basically by uh, by being able to to fly. It's a fantastic world to get into, and if I can help people like you to do that, I am really really happy. Now, once again, Meg, um, if you, especially if you have had severe flight anxiety, uh, I would definitely want to get in contact with you for checking out my program once I've built it, my my uh, course. Um, because like I feel that it's 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 crucial that I get it right uh, before I start selling it to people obviously so please get in contact with me through the app if you I haven't got the app already you definitely should should have it anyway because that's going to be one of the, the kind of secret sources of this um, nervous flyer program as well is that you will get access to the the courses through the app as well so you'll be able to use it in offline mode and um the the society there like the the chat and the the different um forums where you'll be able to talk to other people who are nervous flyers or who are aviation enthusiasts or commercial pilots if you have questions like you obviously do so um uh, please get in contact mark lavin thank you very much I love that you guys are starting to use <laughs> these emojis. Dave P, a small token of appreciation for the info and time you share. Keep it up. Chance of collab with Dutch Pilot Girl? You never know. Um, I haven't been in contact with her for a long while now. Uh, but you never know. It would be like, I love doing collabs. I, I, like one of the most fun videos I did this year, or last year, was with um, uh, with 74 Gear. Like that was, that was, that was hilarious. Um, I'd love to do more of that. Ian, Jill, I wouldn't sit waiting for the max. Holding your breath could be a problem. I would love a picture of Pachi with a pair of shades. Hmm. Pachi with a pair of shades, you say? Do I have a pair of shades here? I don't. Ah, I'll see what I can do. Uh, when it comes to the max, we will have, just have to wait and see. At the moment, I don't think that the airlines are too worried about getting their maxes anytime soon anyway. Chris H, uh, what should you think US regional airline hiring will look like in 2020 with the virus outbreak? I'm sitting on 1200 hours right now, and the regions you recommend would flown through a legacy. Uh, well, I mean, <clears throat> for me, the United States and the, the way that you guys hire is a little bit foreign to me. I haven't had any contact with the United Regionals or the, the big boys over there in the US. Um, I think 2020, to be perfect honest, is going to be a dead year. As in, I think that it's going to be a very hard year to get jobs. I don't think it's going to be impossible, unless, but unless something, like we'll see what happens in the U.S. It's man, it is possible that you manage to 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 keep the outbreak there. But if it turns out to the way that it looks in Europe, where travel restrictions and grounded flights and borders are closed and things like that, well then. It's hard to see that the airlines is going to have be able to do anything else than reduce their work 
force rather than increase it. And if that's the case, it's going to be very hard to get into it. However, if it doesn't turn out to be the case, then yeah, I think you're sitting in a very you know golden position because there's been a problem, a homegrown problem of pilot shortage in the US for ages. And it's just going to get worse in the next few years as the baby boomers goes into, um, uh, into mandatory um, retirement as well. Now, for those of you who doesn't know what that is, is that there was a huge group of babies born in the 1950s, okay? Uh, they're called the baby booming generation, and um, a lot of them became pilots. So that's why you see so many gray-haired gentlemen in the cockpit. Um, now, they were supposed to retire at 60 initially, but then they changed the, re the mandatory retirement age to 65. By doing that, they could kind of use them for a few years longer, but from 2022 and up through to 2025, 26, somewhere around there, they are going to go into retirement. And that's huge. They call it in, in Europe, we call it the the uh, mountain of fat. <laughs> that's it. it's, a, it's a huge amount of people that is just going to go into retirement. It's going to put a lot of strain on the economics of a lot of states. And I think that's why they, they call it like that. Um, but that those are going to go into retirement now. And that will cause in theory, an even bigger pilot uh, shortage. Now, I always say in theory, because remember, a few, like if you go back a year and you watch my live streams for them, I said that right now everything is looking good. It's likely that it's going to slow down a little bit, but unless something crazy happens, then it's going to look good. Now, something crazy has happened, all right? These are the kind of things that I was referring to that you cannot plan for. Outbreaks of diseases, wars, things like that. Um, but there is some light to this as well. If we manage to keep this outbreak at bay, let's say that this just takes a few months and then we're back at it again, well then we have a very low oil price which is going to help the, um, uh, the airlines. The maxes will be coming back during the summer, I'm fairly sure of that. And, uh, and when they come back in, there's going to be a surge of, of um, capacity in the airline business. And providing that there are passengers there who are willing to fly, we might see this picking up quite quickly. So I want to kind of, I don't, I don't want to scare you too much, but there is also a chance that it's going to be quite bad for the next year or so. Uh, young Mark. With the slowdown of air travel due to Corona, uh, how will pilots achieve their flight hours in order to keep their aviation license active? Well, um, we don't really need flight hours to keep it active, actually. Um, worst case scenario, you would have to go in and you have to do um, checks on the or simulate the flights on a regular interval, and that can be done. So that's likely what's going to happen. Like me, well, now I'm, I'm going to be not flying for over two months. I am going to have to do either just a flight with another TRI, um, which is likely going to be one of my colleagues, or I might even have to go in and do recurrent sim training in the simulator in order for me to go back to line. I could do that every two months or so for a quite long time before it becomes a problem. Uh, good, I'm going to take this last few questions now, guys, because I'm coming up to an hour here and <coughs> my voice is disappearing. So don't do any more super chat questions, please, unless you just want to support the channel. <laughs> Thomas Dalton, hi mentor. On a recent video, you mentioned that land after clearances. What do you think about multi clearing multiple planes at a time like they do in the US? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. If you mean on parallel runways, obviously that's not a problem. Uh, I don't see them clearing people to multiple people to land at the same time. That would be extremely dangerous. So I, I, this might be something you probably know what you're talking about. I'm not 100% sure that I understand it. So just, like I said, go through the app and we can talk about it there. Ray Change, 20% of us smoke more elsewhere. Can you stick us in the back? Uh, let's see. I have to go up to the normal chat here to try to find that exact question because... It, 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 it. Sorry there, um, because sometimes half of the super chat question just disappears. So then I have to go up to see it in a normal chat um, to see what it was. So I'm going to try to do that here. There's a lot of questions, guys. I'm so happy to see that there's so many people here. There we go. 20% of us smoke, more elsewhere. Can't you stick us in the back and we pay more? Then the filtration system can go back five times better than... <laughs> no, because the problem is not the smoke. The problem is the, the chance of, uh, of fire. And if, you, if there's one thing that you don't want on an aircraft, it is fire. 
right? Um, the fact that it has ever been allowed is crazy and it will never ever be allowed again unless you fly on a private chartered aircraft or your own aircraft by that way that you can decide yourself. But but smoking on a passenger aircraft with people putting out their cigarettes uh, all over the place and using lighters and things, you will never see that again because of the, the sheer risk potential of an ember falling off, you know, a, a fire breaking out. It is not worth it. Um, patches, my friend, something like that, chewing gums, just to take you through the flight. Or quit smoking, you know, if it, like it has never been a better time to do it since the coronavirus seems to be attacking smokers more than the general population as well because of the um, respiratory system being attacked. Um, it might be time to, to consider just stopping smoking altogether. And guys, I'm going to take some questions here from the normal chat as well before I get going. And then you look a little sick. No, it's just I'm just tired. And now I've been talking nonstop for an hour. So now I'm losing my voice. Not a problem. Uh, easiest plane to butter a landing. Um, I've heard that the 747 is supposed to be quite easy to do a really good landing with because of the multiple landing gear system and stuff. So I will probably go for that. Uh, now 74 gear is probably going to call me up and challenge me to, to landing in the 747 um, simulator, which I will take up, by the way, if he does. Um, this is my first time watching a live stream as it is live. Well, Carlos, I hope that you enjoy it. I hope that you all enjoy these live streams. I will try to do them more in the future. Uh, I, I feel bad now. I don't. I won't be spamming again. Well, that's good. <laughs> uh, would you recommend a young engineer to switch career in order to become a pilot? Um, well, it depends on what you want. You know, um, if if flying is what you want, then absolutely, that's that's what you should be doing. I would probably take it a little bit easy right now to see where all this coronavirus is going to take us in the industry. Like I said, we're on uncharted territory now. I've never seen anything like it. So consider waiting a little bit maybe to change in career. But yeah, I mean, I uh, that's I keep telling people that you have to go for your dreams, guys. And if, if, uh, if flying is what you want to do, you have to try it. No one will ever, you will never ever blame yourself for trying to do something that you want to do, but you will blame yourself for not trying. So think of that. And Wild World Wes it has the last super chat question with "Thank you, sir. Until next time." Good. That's it, guys. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, see you in my next live stream, which is probably going to be next Sunday, Sunday at ten o'clock, so same time. So that's going to be twenty-one UTC as well. And uh, yeah, before you go, guys, um, make sure that you um, that you pop over to the Metro Aviation chat like Mentor Aviation app, I always go over there after this to kind of chill out a little bit, and warm up my thumbs a little bit in the chat. And, and also guys, if you are interested in doing a type rating on the 737 at some point, I've actually gotten some feedback that people are using the uh, collections that you have in the app to prepare for the type rating, um, that, which makes me really happy because it means that people are actually, people who are flying the 737 feels that it is helpful. And the way that they, that they do this is they, um, um, well, first of all, they have the app. Now, this is the old version of the app. The newer one looks much better. But they get one of the collections, which might be, for example, a full setup of the 737 from when it's dark until it's ready to taxi, or a TCAS maneuver, or wind shear escape maneuver, or a CAT 3 ILS approach to go around, or something like that. You can get that, and the way that it works is that once you have bought it, then you'll be able to sit together with me and my co-pilot when we do these exercises. So it will feel just like you're sitting on the jumps with me. You can either scroll around using your fingers to look how what we're doing in the cockpit, so you can watch what I am doing, you know, on the Cat 3, for example, and then you can look over and see what the first officer is doing. Or you can just move this, the, uh, the device around, that will also scroll. Or if you have a pair of uh, Google Cardboard glasses, if you put those on, well then it's going to be just like you're sitting with us in the cockpit. You'll be able to move your head around and look around uh, in real time as we're doing these exercises. So, you know, try it out. Go and try the collection. The one that I always, um, the one that I always recommend is the the all in one. Like if you got the all in one, then you get close to two hours of uh, seven three seven instruction for me for twenty dollars, which is cheaper than you'll get it anywhere else. I can promise you that. Uh, but the app in itself is free, 
Um, but if you do want to, let's say that you want to, to do these live streams in the app, which I do, I try to do in two, three times a week, uh, then you can become a premium member as well. And then you'll be able to ask questions in the live streams. You'll be able to see the CVs of all the other users and also get access to special materials that I do, premium materials in the app, which you can um, stream. You don't have to download it like the other videos. You can just stream it. And with that, I hope that you're doing absolutely fantastic. Take care of yourselves out there and I'll see you next time.